Good evening, and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name is Thomas Sheehan. I'm the cathedral organist and associate director of music here. Tonight, we will be hearing a concert called Enchanting Voices, music of Barbara Strozzi and Francesca Caccini. Uh, Alyssa Edwards will be singing, and Richard Kolb will be playing the lute for this evening's concert, and uh, we hope you enjoy it very much. Uh, before we begin, it would be wonderful if you could like our Washington National Cathedral Music Department Facebook page, and if you can find it possible to be to generously give to our music department, you can do so at www.cathedral.org slash music giving. And now without further ado, Enchanting Voices. <laughs> The virtuosic vocal lines of this 17th century Italian style of singing are both challenging and fun to perform. You will hear a plethora of vocal techniques in the concert, including the use of spontaneous florid ornamentation that embellishes the written line. 
You may notice that my sound is a little different from the typical classical singer's approach. For example, in order to keep a more agile and nimble and declamatory approach, I put slightly less pressure on my instrument to maintain that texture. The duet-like nature of the Theorbo and voice allow for a greater sense of flexibility with tempo and more creativity in the communication of the text. In the Baroque era, rhetoric was of utmost importance as music was supposed to move the passions. Throughout the concert, you will hear me using a vast array of contrasting vocal colors and playful ornamental gestures to further draw out the emotion of the text. In particular, you will hear the trillo, which is a tremolo-like repetition of a single pitch, which helps to add emphasis to important words. You will hear these most prominently in Francesca Caccini's sacred aria, Ecco che ho verso il sangue. In Strazzi's La Strato, the singer explores all of the emotions as she seeks to find a song to soothe her suffering. Strazzi shows off her compositional mastery as she playfully takes us on a tour of 17th century song styles. Our whole collaboration began with Richard's complete works edition of Barbara Strozzi's music. And our latest phase of our project is our recently released album, Vago Desio, on the Asis label that contains some of our favorite arias and cantatas from Opus 8. Strozzi's music always reflects both her familiarity with the voice and the enjoyment she herself must have received from singing.
Patriarchal repression in the 17th century generally prevented women from having careers as composers. But Francesca Caccini and Barbara Strozzi were two notable exceptions. Thanks to a combination of outstanding musical gifts, strength of character, well-executed strategy, and the support of people with influence, they established themselves among the leading musical voices of their respective generations. Barbara Strozzi's career unfolded in the lively cultural scene of mid 17th century Venice, where her father, Giulio Strozzi, was a well-known literary figure who used his influence to launch her career in Venetian high society. Her social position was precarious because her mother was a servant and probably a courtesan. So when Giulio Strozzi died in 1652, Barbara lost her main connection to high society. She had no official court position or patron, so her career would normally have ended at that point. But instead, with amazing drive and brilliant networking skills, she went on to produce six volumes of arias and cantatas. By the mid-1650s, she was recognized as one of Venice's best composers of vocal chamber music and considered on a par with such famous male contemporaries as Francesco Cavalli and Giovanni Rovetta. Francesca Caccini's career in Florence, a generation earlier, couldn't have been more different. Her social position was relatively straightforward as the daughter of the famous Giulio Caccini, who was one of the most famous musicians at the Tuscan court. Thanks largely to his training and maneuvering, Francesca obtained a position as a singer and composer at the court in 1607 at the age of 20. The circumstance that worked most in favor of her career was that it coincided with the time when Christine de Lorraine was the de facto ruler of Tuscany. It was important for the Tuscan state to be seen in Europe as being successfully ruled by enlightened female authority. And Francesca's music was promoted as the musical embodiment female excellence and virtue, symbolizing the Tuscan state. Sadly, only one book of Francesca's songs and a small chamber opera are all that survive from her many compositions. 
but they're among the finest representatives of the second generation of Florentine monody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
stabilito, poiché gli l'ha stabilito, nuovo giorno e ti ripensi, poiché gli l'ha stabilito, nuovo giorno e ti ripensi, non corri, non corri,
tell you that delightful as sopranos are, they can sometimes be temperamental. It's always a pleasure to work with Alyssa, but this morning she was upset with the way things are going with her boyfriend, and uh, I couldn't get her decide to decide on a song to end our program with. Uh, she said she couldn't find anything that suits her mood. Um, we've got a whole book of songs to choose from. But, uh, well, now actually she's gone off and I just hope she'll come back to sing anything at all. Just have to see what happens. Then. Sì, vorrei. Subito, 
Sikon po na kwilan natin, Giorno. Oh, my God. 